Well, thank you for your welcome. When Jonathan asked me to speak on prayer, he said I could choose any passage in the Bible. <laughs> I agree. Uh, and so I started looking, and I mean, when I say prayer, probably immediately some passages come to your mind. Possibly a whole lot of them, and if we were to add them all up across the room, there would be a huge number of them. And so I thought of all these passages, I looked on the internet and other places, and there are a lot, there are a lot. And immediately that tells us that prayer is central to discipleship. It tells us that you and I need to learn how to pray and to pray regularly and to be disciplined in it. Well, then I did what I probably should have started with. I stopped, I listened, and I prayed. (laughs) That's a really good thing to do when you're going to preach on prayer. And guess what? That's the passage that came to mind. That's the one that grabbed hold of me and I thought, all right, I need to do that. I need to pray on that, uh, talk about that Genesis passage. It does qualify because it is a conversation between Abraham and God. So it's a passage about prayer. Nonetheless, I was a little surprised because at first it is actually quite a difficult passage And my deep and abiding sense is that the God who's come near to us in Jesus Christ does not destroy cities. So what do we do with that? I felt I couldn't draw out of this what it says about prayer until I dealt with that primary issue. It seems in this passage that God wants to destroy a city. Now I recognise straight away that this is a really ancient writing and these people were only just beginning to get a glimpse of God. It's, it's, it's all well, well and good for us to look back on it after the, the Old and the New Testaments and say, well, this is a pretty strange understanding, but this is right at the very, very beginning. Now, God has a conversation with himself. Do you do that? I bet you do. So God's talking to himself where he wonders whether he would share with Abraham what he's going to do. Now, he clearly does. He does share his plans because Abraham knows about them. For the first point I want to make today about prayer is that when we talk to God, we can know the very heart of God, the very deep things of God, the things maybe that even God is struggling with. God trusts us with our intimate knowledge. And that on its own strikes me as the most extraordinary thing. How is it that we can know the heart of the God of the universe? Now the passage says that Abraham will become a great and powerful nation and that all nations will be blessed through him. That's a repeat, really, of Genesis 12. So that's his original calling. And I think maybe Jonathan said last week that all of these things start with calling, and we are all called. But Abram, as he was then in Genesis 12, is called. And and it says that he'll be a blessing to all peoples. And in Genesis 18, you would have heard, it says that Abraham will bless all peoples by keeping the ways of the Lord and by doing what is right and just. That is how it happens. So a question for you today, does destroying cities fit with that? Is it a way of the Lord? And is it right and just? Now I don't know what you're thinking, but you know what I'm thinking, because I don't think it is. As I reflected on this reading, more listening to God, A story from my own life came to mind. So someone we know, at the time when I was thinking about this, had just finished a couple of weeks of uh, work experience. And they've now gone on and been appointed as an apprentice carpenter. Now they're a really young person. I, I don't think they've used their hands on a piece of wood ever. A lot on a keyboard uh, on, and on their phone, but not as a person who works with wood. And so obviously when the carpenter starts to work with them, they're starting from the very basics, the very first skills. Maybe even this is how you hold a saw or, or whatever. And now that they've gone on to be an apprentice, there's four years of training that will occur. And somewhere at the end of that four years, there'll be a testing of what they've learned. So I think this story helps, would help me with Genesis 18. Abraham, perhaps, is being tested. He knows something of the mind of God. 
because God's already spoken to him. He's been told he'll be a blessing and that that will occur because God's chosen him so that he'll direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. You've heard that a few times. You might hear it again. God will teach Abraham and Abraham will teach others. Abraham has been told what he has to do. He's been told something of the character that he must have, the same character as God. You know, it is one thing to be told, it's another thing to live it out. Those two things are very different. We can have all sorts of ideas about God, but that can be very different to how we live. To go back to my illustration, an apprentice will be tested, I guess at various points along the way, but certainly at the end of four years, to see what he or she has learnt about their craft. And I think that the passage we have heard today is God testing Abraham to see if he understands the ways of the kingdom of God. It's one thing to know about the kingdom of God, it's another thing to live in kingdom ways. Now we have a number of teachers here. How many teachers have we got today? We can see a few. It's probably a dangerous thing to say, correct me if I'm wrong. (laughs) But I think a teacher would normally pass on information in various sorts of ways, and these days very creative ways and so on, And then they would test the student to see if they'd understood what they'd been taught. So you can think about an apprentice that way. But I think in this passage, it's a different way of teaching. It's like the master builder building something really wrongly and then seeing what the apprentice says. Will the apprentice dare to question the master builder and say, That's not what you do. I wonder if that's what's happening here. God is throwing something out and he's seeing whether Abraham has understood the ways of the kingdom of God. And so the story we have before us is Abraham putting that into place. He establishes that if there's a mighty city doing all kinds of wrong things, but if there are 50, 45, 30, 20 or 10 righteous people, God will not destroy the city. Not destroying the city when there are 10 is a way of the Lord, and it is right and just. Abraham seems to be taking God to task and proving that he understands something about who God actually is. And I would urge you in your prayers to take God to task. Don't be shy about it. If you've got a decent relationship, it's worth an argument. It's worth being really pushy and worth struggling with God to find out what God's Uh, God's way is. Don't be a shrinking violet. It's worth noting that 10 Jewish men was the minimum number required for a synagogue to be established. So I suspect the number 10 is not accidental at all. Quite deliberate. Now you can come up with a completely different understanding of that passage if you want to. I don't mind. But it's where I'm going to sit for now. God tests Abraham and he shows that he's understood something about the ways of the kingdom. And then as the conversation between God and Abraham unfolds, we can see there are four critical points about prayer. And it's those I want to focus on now. The first one is, be clear about what you're praying for. Now the two things I want to say, and possibly the first one is a bit pointed. There's a word that has become part of the Australian prayer vocabulary that I think is really unhelpful. And that word, any guesses, is the word just. I just, hear it so, I just hear it so many times that I felt I had to speak about it. God, I just ask, or Jesus, I just ask. It sounds to me like we're asking for just a little thing, like we really don't want to bother God. It feels like we're not confident about what we're asking for, or perhaps still worse, we're not confident in God. God delights in hearing our prayers. Our cry of our heart delights in us being in close relationship with him. So I'm suggesting as an example that we don't pray, God, I just ask that I could discern really clearly about this decision I've got to make. I'm suggesting we ask with confidence. God, I ask to discern what your will is about this matter so I can be obedient really strong, really confident, really clear. 
Second thing I note is how specific Abraham is. When the, you know, what if there are 50? What if there are 45, 40, 30, 20, 10? Every time he asks, he's really specific. I wonder how specific your prayers are. Years ago, I read a book by Yongi Cho, who's a Korean minister. I think the book was called The Fourth Dimension, and I couldn't find it in my library. I've got it somewhere. So I tell you this from memory. Now, you need to pay attention because there's going to be a responsive part in the middle, and you're going to have to learn what it is because I'm not going to tell you. When he first started ministry, he had absolutely nothing. He was very poor. He felt a strong call from God, so he had the call. He started, and so he prayed for a desk. He thought a desk would be really helpful for writing sermons and admin and all sorts of other things. He prayed repeatedly, believing that God would want such a thing for his ministry. Nothing happened. Now, in a while, you need to be able to speak the words of God. In a while. Eventually, Yongi Cho asked God, why aren't you answering my prayer? Now, you can see there's a, there's a, there's a you know, good conversation happening here. Why aren't you, God? And as clear as anything, God replied, you haven't told me what sort of desk you want. <laughs> Yongi Cho prayed very specifically for, for the type of desk he wanted, how big it was, what it was made of, how many drawers it had, and not very long after that, a desk exactly like that turned up and he said, praise the Lord. Well, then he prayed for a chair. Prayed for a chair to use for my desk. That's a pretty useful thing to go with a desk. Prayed for it for for a number of times and nothing happened. He said to God, why aren't you providing with a chair? And I think you know where I'm going. God said, you haven't asked me what sort of chair you want. He said, God, I pray for one of those black chairs that has wheels on the bottom and it's got adjustments for arm height and back support and all those sorts of things. And not very long after, a chair exactly like that was provided and he praised God. That's not the response, but anyway. (laughs) And Yongi asked for a bike. You know, a bike's a pretty useful thing to get around his ministry area. So much easier if you've got a bike. So you're ready for your response. Yongi prayed for a very long time and nothing happened. And yes, then he prayed to God, why aren't you providing me with a bike? And God said, you haven't told me what sort of bike you want. Well, he did tell him. He said, I want one of those black Chinese ones with a really strong frame. And not very long after, a bike exactly like that turned up and he praised God. Of course, underlying that is this dialogue. This dialogue is Yongi's understanding that God wants conversation and wants to answer our prayers. So the first point is be really specific. Don't be shy about being specific. And of course, one of the things about being specific is you you know it's been answered or not. If you're really general and waffly, you won't know whether you've been answered. But when it's really specific, you'll know. Second point, pray in agreement with the nature of the kingdom of God. God is not going to do something that is counter to the values of the kingdom or counter to God's nature. Of course. So Abraham is to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And that is going to happen in such a way that all nations on earth will be blessed. So he can't destroy Sodom because that would be counter to blessing. So one of the most commonly repeated verses in the Old Testament is, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, has compassion on all he has made. Now that verse is there a whole lot of times, sometimes with a slight change in in wording. But you may want to do a search when you get home and just see how many times that comes up. And the more it comes up, the more it is a critical point about God. It's there a lot. Or you could look at the New Testament and see what the common themes are. You know, when Jesus begins his ministry, he quotes Isaiah 61 with a few variations. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is announcing his mission statement here. We should pray in agreement with that. Well, you could go to John 3 and find that God so loved the world that he sent his son, what? Not to condemn the world, but to save it. Abraham doesn't want to condemn Sodom. He wants to save it. He wants to give it time to change, to repent. 
So my second point is pray in a way that's consistent with the character of God and the nature of the kingdom of God. Thirdly, persist in your prayers. We can clearly see that Abraham is persistent in his prayer, so persistent and pointed that he knows he's pushing the boundaries of polite conversation and pushing them with God. He says he's being bold in his prayer. He says, may the Lord not be angry with me as he keeps lowering the number of righteous people that might be found in that city. Be persistent in your prayers. And Paul says in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Or Luke 18, the persistent widow. There's plenty of passages about it. Pray about what is on your heart and keep praying about it. Listen to what God says and if directed, change your prayer. But persist. And then the fourth and last point is to note Abraham's focus. And I'll put this in terms so that, so that we can focus on it. In your prayers, make your focus compassion, mercy, forgiveness and the chance to change. Not judgment. Jeremiah 29 includes a passage about the exile. So they've been captured from Israel and taken as prisoners. And the, the thing they want to do is get back home. They want to get back home. They want to be rescued. But God says, don't pray to escape, but settle, build houses, get married, plant gardens, and then says, also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too, you will too. See the interconnection there. That to stay, that, 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 to be a witness to God, to pray for the city. And often, I'm afraid, Christians are known as judgmental or condemnatory or superior. It's the quickest way to end a conversation and a relationship. What if we pleaded in prayer for our city? What if we asked God to show mercy, compassion? What if we loved our neighbour? Instead of thinking they shouldn't be doing that. What have we cried out to God to pour mercy on them, to pour compassion on them, to fill their heart with love? So, God wants to reveal his heart to us. Pray specifically. Pray in agreement with what we know about the nature of God and the kingdom of God. Persist in your prayers. And finally, be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. Love your enemies. Draw from the goodness that God has placed in you. Some things to think about in relation to prayer.